Jesse is because he's another football player that we have in, Jesse Sapulo. Um, but this is Peter, and his middle name is Navy. So I'm going to get it totally right now. Peter Navy Tuiasasopo. Say that after me five times quickly. <laughs> Peter Navy Tuiasasopo, okay? And then I'm giving away my age. I don't know anything about these movies and everything. <laughs> And the young lady came up and told me Street Fighter isn't a movie, it's a video game. <laughs> so evidently he was a part of that. They made a movie out of it too. Okay, well, this is, this is all coming out now. We're getting excited. But uh, several other movies besides, or video games besides Street Fighter, I just named the one that was uh, corresponding to that picture there. Do you agree with me that what you get out of church is what you put into it? <laughs> that if you really focus, that if you really want to hear from God, it's going to be a better experience? I'm wondering if you'll just bow your heads and repeat this quick prayer after me. Um, and maybe this will help us to uh, get our mind in full concentration and get our, our hearts to the place where we, we have the right heart uh, to receive the word of God. So just pray this prayer. This was a prayer of Samuel the prophet. When God was calling him to be a prophet. We just want to emulate that prayer. And say this right now after me. Speak Lord. Your servant hears. And Father. Give me the Holy Spirit right now that I may be able to concentrate on you, my Creator and Redeemer, my Lord and my God. My Lord and my God. In Jesus' name, In Jesus name. Amen. amen. As I already remarked at the beginning of the service when we did that responsive reading, that the first person to see Jesus after his resurrection uh, was Mary Magdalene. And what makes this so unique, and even to the point where it can give us a feeling of pathos about her being chosen to be the first one, is that if you look in Luke chapter 8 and verse 2, Mary Magdalene is the one whom previously Jesus had cast out seven demons from her. So isn't that something that this person who was delivered from demon possession gets this privilege? And obviously, you've probably seen uh, the movie The Passion of the Christ. Obviously, Jesus was bludgeoned and bloody and, and you know, just uh, maimed uh, in this thing of the crucifixion. And Mary, as we saw in our text, um, thought that someone had taken him. She didn't realize he was risen from the dead. So as she's looking into this tomb, wondering what, who might have taken him, and Jesus encounters her, at first, she doesn't recognize him because he's risen from the dead, and um, she doesn't remember seeing him that way just a couple of days before that when he was crucified. Finally, as she begins to recognize him, though, uh, and she makes her reaction to him, obviously she's very excited, as all of us would be, uh, to have this great surprise that there he is, alive from the dead. Uh, obviously, she is preparing for a very strong reaction, like obviously just hugging Jesus and clinging to him, and this is where we get his curious statement to her. If you look at the first part of John chapter 20 and verse 17, Jesus says unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father. The Greek grammar here indicates that what we have translated in the King James Bible, touch me not, could be understood as what? First thing? 
stop clinging to me or do not hold on to me. So when, when you look at the Greek grammar, the New Testament was written in Greek and, and you look at it, uh, it could be translated rather than what we see here in our King James Bible, touch me not, for I have not yet ascended to my Father. It could have been translated, um, stop clinging to me, do not hold on to me. Um, and then, of course, he's going to give her instructions, as we'll see in a few moments, to go to the disciples and let them know the good news that, that she has seen. So, when Jesus says, touch me not, I do not imagine that these words are conveying a sternness to Mary at all. I suppose if you watch the series The Chosen and seen just how uh, they portray Jesus, uh, again, I don't think, even though this, this wording looks a little, a little stern in, in our translation, maybe it's lost a little in translation, I don't imagine that he's conveying sternness here. Uh, Mary, don't touch me. I think she'd already began to, to hug him, and he's saying this in a sense of jovialness. That, you know, kind of being unassuming and, okay, Mary, okay, okay, Mary, uh, touch me not, don't cling to me, uh, don't hold on to me because um, I've risen from the dead and we're just getting this thing started. We've got things to do now. I have died on the cross to take away the sin of the world. I have risen from the dead just the way the Old Testament prophesied that the Messiah of Israel would. And so let's not get uh, too emotional right now. Um, all this has happened. This is the third day. And we are just getting started, Mary. You have no idea of where all this is going. Once I ascend back to my Father. So Jesus is kind of, I think, in a jovial way, expressing to her um, prophecy. And, and, and get, getting her into the idea that I'm only going to be with you 40 more days. I'm only here for 40 days. And then after that, you're going to have to relate to me like every other believer throughout the centuries, you're going to have to relate to me through the Holy Spirit. So again, um, I just, as I study this, I've changed, changed my thoughts about this curious wording, touch me not, for I have not yet ascended to my Father. Uh, I've changed my, my thoughts and, and see this as something that was probably a jovial way of Jesus expressing himself to her at that moment. Because who could blame her for wanting to hug him and hold on to him after the trauma that she witnessed that, that he suffered through and her broken heart. You know, when we, we started this narrative in verse 11, she was weeping at his tomb. And so the angels had to ask her, why are you weeping? And she was afraid that someone had taken the Lord, his body. And so that's, that's where she was coming from when Jesus encountered her. So what we want to do today in our message is, as we think about this instruction Jesus gives her, we, we want to think some more if he took the time to elaborate to her what is going to take place once he ascends to the Father, because that's what he's concentrating on, after 40 days, he will ascend to heaven uh, to sit on the throne with God the Father. But if he were to have elaborated to Mary uh, about this thing just getting started, what else might he say to her? That's what we're going to concentrate on for the rest of the, the message today, what he might have said to her. And first of all, uh, I would submit that he could have said to her, if he elaborated, when I ascend, 
I am going to begin a new creation. When I ascend to the Father, I am going to start in this world, spiritually, a new creation. I am going to make a new creation out of those who have been dead in trespasses and sins. And we see this idea of the new creation in the rest of the verse. This is very interesting. He says uh, in the latter part of verse number seven, 17, as, as we've, we've read already, I am not yet ascended to my Father, but go to my brethren, Mary, and say unto them, I ascend unto my Father and your Father, and to my God and your God. Now put your index finger under that word brethren. Go to my brethren, Jesus says. Do you realize that this is the first time that Jesus has ever called his disciples my brethren? In the past he referred to them as his disciples and also as his servants and even towards the end of his life he identified them as his friends. But now, when he talks about ascending to his Father, now that he's risen from the dead and going back to the Father, he refers to them in this new way as my what? Brother. Brother. My brethren. Because of his death on the cross, in the place of the sinner, this new relationship with Christ was made possible, this new relationship that you are my brethren. This new relationship, my brethren, speaks of Jesus' new creation. If you take your Bibles and turn to Hebrews chapter 2 and verse number 9, The Bible talks more about this, that in the new creation, we become the brothers and sisters of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's incredible. His death and resurrection had to happen before this could be, but it is the reality for all those who have trusted in Jesus that we are his brothers and sisters. And the book of Hebrews speaks of this if you look in verse number 9, and we're going to read on down to verse number 13, it says, But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for whom? Every man. Every man. For it became him for whom are, are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons into glory. That's new creation, right? Being brought into glory, becoming the children of God, by whom are all things in bringing many sons into glory to make the captain, speaking of Jesus, or a synonym for captain would be author, to make the captain or author of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For both he that sanctifies and they who are sanctified are all what? One. One. New creation. Children entering into glory and being made one with Jesus. Look at the rest of the verse. For which cause the Lord Jesus is not ashamed... To call them what? Amen. Brethren. And here's some Old Testament scriptures that prophesy that we would get this honor when we accept Jesus as our Savior as being thought of as his brethren. This is Old Testament scriptures that prophesy this. Verse 12 saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the what? Church. Church will I sing praise unto thee. That's Psalm 22, 22, that prophecy. 
And here in verse number 13, another prophecy in the Old Testament. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children which God hath given me. So we see this, this new creation. Mary, this thing is just getting started. When I ascend to the Father, I am going to make on earth, spiritually, a new creation. These words that we read, um, we can get a little paraphrase on them and look on the screen just maybe to give a little more uh, crystallization of understanding. We go back to verse 10 and kind of paraphrase what we just read. God for whom and through whom everything was made chose to bring many children into glory. And it was only right that he should... Uh, my verse 10 got in there anyway. Cross that out. Uh, it was only right that he should make Jesus, through his suffering, a perfect leader fit to bring them into their salvation. So that's kind of a paraphrase of verse 10 that we read. Verse 11. So now Jesus and the ones he makes holy have the same what? Father. Father. That is why Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. Does everybody see this incredible situation that is a blessing for us? So when we think about the joy and the hope of being part of a new creation, you know, we hear nowadays so many political leaders, including our president, who say that the answer to all that is wrong in the world is to establish a new world order. That is not God's answer. God's answer to everything that is wrong in this world is not government making a mandated new world order. God's answer to everything going wrong is allowing Jesus to make a new creation. Amen. That is our answer. And that's why Jesus was eager not to have Mary just clinging to him, but for him to get going, to get to his disciples, to take care of business, and in 40 days get out of here so he can get that going. If Jesus were to elaborate to her, at that moment, at the tomb, as he told her, okay, Mary, don't, don't get carried away here. We've got things to do. He would not only say that I'm going to ascend to my Father for the purpose of making a new creation, but I'm going to ascend to my Father to become the high priest and the shepherd of every single person who accepts me into their lives. Wow, how could this be? How could this be that Jesus will become to each and every one of us our priest and our shepherd? How could that be? Well, the Bible is going to explain this, but he is because we look in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 25. Read this verse with me, for you were like sheep going astray, but now have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. The Bible expressly says that Jesus is the shepherd and the overseer, or our King James Bible says bishop, or the high priest of our souls. If you turn to John chapter 14, he will tell us how that dynamic takes place. Through what power, through what reality it takes place that Jesus can be your priest and my priest. Jesus can be your shepherd and my shepherd. This past week, I just met with a couple pastors who went down to Cuba a communist country, and they're helping churches down there. The churches are very beleaguered. Um, they say that there's religious freedom, but they're highly 
regulated and surveilled. These pastors even um, were living, surprisingly, they didn't think it was that way because you don't see it in the tourist commercials, but they were living in a third world situation. They said to me right before we ate, man, we didn't even have toilet seats on the toilet. I said, can we talk about this after we eat? <laughs> it doesn't seem like the best subject right now. But being I was buying, I took them to the Golden Corral. I figured that will be cheap and they'll go away full and I will look like a hero. But uh, I did try and change the subject, but they were surprised about the third world thing and it got tricky. At some point they had a driver and all of a sudden when they found out what these guys were all about, that driver disappeared and they got another driver and the pastor that was hosting them, the Cuban pastor said, I think what's happened is you are now being surveilled by the police. That's your driver. <laughs> so watch what you say. But uh, it's amazing that even in communist countries, those people, just the same as you and I, have Jesus as their shepherd, as their priest. So Jesus explains how this is possible after his ascension. If you look at John chapter 14 and find verse number 16. Jesus is talking about him going away, just like he had said to Mary. And when that happens, he says, And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter. Put that index finger under, your word, under the word another. There's two Greek words that could be translated another. One Greek word indicates another of a different kind. One Greek word indicates another of the same kind. This another is of the same kind. So Jesus is saying, I will send you another of the same kind, the comforter, that he may abide with you for how long? Forever. Forever. What is the identity of the comforter that I'm going to send to everyone who accepts me? He gives this identity in verse number 17. Even the spirit of truth. It's the spirit. Whom the world cannot receive because it sees him not, neither knows him. But you know him, for he dwells with you and shall be where? In you. In you. Then Jesus goes on, even though he said he will be physically leaving them, he says in verse 18, this wonderful promise, I will not leave you comfortless. Even when I am physically gone, I will do what? I will come to you through the Spirit. Through the Spirit, I will come to you and I will be more than with you, I will be in you. And that's how believers, each of us, experience this miraculous dynamic of knowing and experiencing Jesus as not only our priest, but our shepherd. It's this commitment that Jesus has made to us. Now this interesting word here in verse number 18, he says, I will not leave you comfortless. Look on the screen at the Greek word where we get our English word comfortless, it is what? Orphanus. And that sounds a lot like our English word what? Orphans. Jesus is saying, is even though I'm physically leaving you, I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. So that's why he said, Mary, let's concentrate on my ascension. This is the third day, and we are just getting started. I'm going to make a new creation, and I'm going to be for every believer throughout the whole world, not just localized here in Jerusalem, but throughout the whole world, I am going to be a very personal priest and shepherd to all. The Bible attests to this as our shepherd. He is ever present in us. Read Galatians 4, 6 with me out loud. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. Servants were not allowed to call their master Abba. They could call him and address him as a father in 
some sense, but this very intimate word, Abba, is only for children of the, the dad. And it, it actually has the idea of daddy. And we get to call our father Abba because we are not servants, we are children. And what makes us children of God is we share the same DNA as God, and that is the Spirit of God is in our hearts. Amen. We're related Amen. to God the Father by having the Spirit of Christ, as it says here in Galatians 4, 6, where? Into our hearts. So as a shepherd, he is ever present in us. When those pastors went to Cuba, the Lord Jesus went with them to Cuba. He dwelt in their hearts. Amen. He gave them guidance. He gave them lead, leading. He gave them a sense of, of, of what to do. And it's just so wonderful. But we talked about the high priest dyna dynamic. As our high priest, he is in the presence of God for us. And here we see Hebrews 9.24. Read this out loud with me. For Christ has not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. As a shepherd, he is in us. He's ever present in us. As a high priest, he is in the presence of God physically for us. We start off this morning by singing a hymn from our hymn book, In the Garden. There's another hymn in our hymn book that deals with this idea of Christ's resurrection. It's the hymn simply titled, He Lives. And this was written by a gentleman by the name of Alfred Ackley. And as I looked him up, I was surprised to learn that he passed away just three months after I was born. So... That was in 1960. But the year isn't important. I don't want you to remember that. Uh, what's important is I was born April 2nd. If you're taking notes, that's April 2nd. And he passed away sometimes in July. You don't need the year. I gave you all the information you need. But it was just... It was interesting to me because April 2nd is coming up quickly <laughs> to realize that this man who wrote this beautiful song actually left this earth the year that I entered this earth. But he wrote a bunch of songs, but he also preached. And it is recorded that around 1933 he had been preaching at a series of revival services. And he noticed that this young man had attended for several days. Back then, these services would go on for uh, many days. And he noticed this, this young man who had attended several days in a row. And it came to be found out that this young man was Jewish. And after one service, he lingered around and desired to speak to uh, Mr. Ackley, and he had a question for Mr. Ackley. As a, as a Jewish young man, he asked him, point blank, why should I worship a dead Jew, is what he asked. And Ackley's response to him, probably being a little shocked by that question. Now, we said Jesus wasn't stern when he said, uh, you know, touch me not, Mary. But this was a stern question, wasn't it? And Ackley's response to him, in turn, led to the writing of this hymn. But he said to the Jewish man, He lives. I tell you, he is not dead, but lives here and now. Jesus Christ is more alive today than ever before. Amen. Amen. I can prove it, he said, by my own experience, as well as the testimony of countless thousands. And of course, after he said that, when he got home, just as you would have thought about it, that was kind of an intense uh, little encounter. He thought about it some more and 
the question, why should I worship a dead Jew? And his response, that I can prove he's alive by my life and, and how he's changed it and countless thousands to do the same. We can prove that he's alive because of what he's done for us. And he wrote the song, He Lives. If you want to get in that blue book again, page 167, you can appreciate uh, what came out of that encounter and his singing. I mean, his song. Just look at that first verse. Um, it kind of summarizes what he said to that young man. Page 167, the song goes, I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that he is living. Whatever men may see, how do I know he's living? I see his hand of mercy, I hear his voice of cheer, and just the time I need him, he's always near. Amen. Amen. Shall we sing the chorus together? He lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. And that's the proof, right? The Spirit of God works in our hearts. He is the Lord is our shepherd. Jesus functions as our high priest. He's in the presence of God for us continually. That's how we get through these tough times in life, right? Amen. How many wake up every now and then and you, you've been through a tough stretch of life and you realize as you wake up, that wasn't me getting me through this. Something was carrying me. I can't even explain it. It's a miracle, but that wasn't me. That wasn't me that got me through this. And this is what um, Alfred Ackley was talking about in that song. It's like, you know, we don't have to get all theological here. You ask me how I know he lives? Because he lives in my heart. So if Jesus could have elaborated to Mary, he could have said, we're just getting started. I'm going to begin a new creation. I'm going to become to every believer a shepherd and priest to every single believer all throughout the world. That's what's going to happen after I ascend. And finally, he could have said, and I'm going to one day defeat death. Amen. Our last scripture is 1 Corinthians 15, if you turn there. And we read about Christ defeating death in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 21 through 26. Paul writes, for since by man came what? Death. Death. That was the original creation, Adam. For since by man came death, by man came also, speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ, resurrection of the dead. For in Adam all die. And that's why the statistics on death have never changed, even though we have all this medical advancement and medical technology. Uh, the statistics on death still remain the same. One out of every one person dies. It's been that way forever since the creation began and Adam sinned. For in Adam all, die, all died, even so in Christ shall all be made what? Alive. Alive, but every man in his own order. Christ, the first fruits, or the prototype, afterward, they that are Christ at his coming. And that's what we talk about in the rapture. The, the dead in Christ are raised. That's what the rapture is all about, at his coming. And then we see in verse 24, then comes the end when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, 
when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power, for he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet, and the last enemy that shall be destroyed is what? Death. Death. The last enemy that will be destroyed, Jesus is going to once and for all defeat death. And that's what these flowers were all about today. In memory of our loved ones who we look forward to because Christ will make all alive our loved ones who we look forward to seeing again, right? Amen. And that's, that's our celebration here today. Not only are we celebrating that Christ is risen, but he is the prototype. We're celebrating that all other believers, all of our loved ones who have passed on, are going to rise and we are going to be reunited. Amen. The world's greatest family reunion is going to happen someday where we'll be all reunited. But today, we can't help but, even though we're focusing on the Lord's resurrection, we can't help but also focus on the ramifications of that concerning us and our own loved ones. And so as Easter has approached, I was thinking about the situation with my mom when she passed on December 4th, 2020. We knew she was right towards the end, and so I got up on that Friday morning and knew that I had to get over there uh, and see her because she was failing. And we'd kind of been doing the, the vigil thing, the watch, and I was very tired, and as I was driving down a laundry boulevard, I was thinking, man, I'm kind of tired. It should be nice to have a donut. And I, I almost went to the donut shop, but at the last moment, something said, no, no, don't, don't delay. Get over there. And so I got there, and I entered into the, the living room where she was, uh, and in her hospital bed, and just my sister was there. And I addressed my mom and said some things to her, tried to encourage her, and sat down. And within two minutes of me being there, she passed away. It was so gentle, it was so soft, we weren't even sure that she had died. No gasping, no nothing, just silence and relaxation. And my sister, like, did she just pass? I said, I think so. And my sister listened for a heartbeat. It wasn't there. And so it's just my sister and I, and I was thinking to myself, I'm sure glad I didn't stop Amen. to get anything. Amen. I'm sure glad the Lord led me to, to get right here. And so it's just my sister and I, and we had to call the hospice nurse out so that she could um, legally <coughs> pronounce her dead. And that's what the hospital the hospice nurse did, and she said something to me that was so sweet as we recounted those last moments. She looked at me and she said, um, your mom was just waiting to hear your voice one more time, and then she, she was free to go. And I appreciated that so much. It was such a sweet thing for her to say, because I knew how close I had come to missing her last breath. And to hear her say that, um, she was just waiting to hear you one more time, and then she felt free to go. It's like, man, that's encouraging to my heart, and it became so significant because the only two people that were with her uh, when she passed was her first daughter and her first son. It was just us two. And even though I appreciated those words, when you lose your mom, a mom as wonderful as she was, those words were not enough. I appreciated them so much, what that hospice nurse said, but we need more than words like that. We need these words. Amen. And that's what really gets us through because the Bible says, 1 Corinthians 15, 22, did you see it? For as, as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Amen. And so, 
I really got through losing my mom, realizing that I'm going to see her someday again. And if it's not for this gospel that we preach, I ask the question, why would we ever want to love any other human being if there is no gospel of Jesus Christ? Why would we go through the problem of even loving any other human being knowing that someday that relationship will be separated by death? If there's no hope of us ever being reunited, it seems almost trivial to ever love somebody. But it is not trivial because we love them here and we get to continue to love them for all eternity because of this gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. And so, remember what I think Jesus' words implied to Mary on that morning of his resurrection. Not sternness, jovialness. Yes, Mary, on this third day, since I was crucified, things are just getting started. Amen. Will you stand with me? Just one question before we wrap up. Jesus was just getting started on that first Easter Sunday. Just one question for you. Have you ever let him get started in your own life? Have you allowed Jesus to get started in you? Because what he wants to do for you, if you will allow him to get started, what he wants to do for you is he wants to make you a part of his new creation. He wants to make you one of his brethren. He wants to know you as his brother or his sister. He wants to be your shepherd and your priest. He wants his spirit to dwell in you and he wants to be in the presence of God for you every day interceding for you. And he wants to, when it's all said and done, give you victory over sin and death. Amen. Amen. So my question to you is, have you ever allowed the Lord Jesus to get things started in your life? Will you bow your heads? With heads bowed and eyes closed, please understand 